Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I am Assistant Professor of Clinical Sciences at California Health Sciences University, and today we'll be discussing sleep disorders. And the reason we're talking about sleep disorders today is because sleep disorders are conditions that may affect sleep onset and or sleep maintenance. And establishing effective sleep habits is an important aspect to maintain normal daily functions. As a pharmacist, it's important to be aware of different sleep disorders that exist, as well as non-pharmacological and pharmacological methods used to treat those sleep disorders, as well as the potential side effects of medications that treat sleep disorders. Our objectives today will be to review the sleep cycle, to differentiate the pathophysiology and presentations of varying sleep disorders, to identify non-pharmacological measures to manage sleep, and to determine appropriate treatment considerations for designated sleep disorders. So we'll start out with patient case. SW is a struggling 23-year-old P3 pharmacy student who comes to class every day and falls asleep in the front row. He constantly wakes up from nightmares, fearing he will fail pharmacy school, to which he exclaims, C equals PharmD. He also has episodes where he's fallen asleep randomly in the student lounge while talking to his friends. Which sleep disorder does SW most likely have? Is it insomnia, narcolepsy, sleep apnea, or jet lag? The next case, DM is a, an 82-year-old Caucasian female presenting to you for a recommendation to help her sleep. She's had difficulty initiating sleep over the last four months and is not taking any other medications. Which of the following would you recommend? Diphenhydramine, doxylamine, Ramelteon, or Zolpidem? In the last sample case, QB, that sounds familiar, is a 33-year-old PGY2 critical care pharmacy resident from Houston traveling to Fresno, California for a job interview. In order to avoid jet lag, QB would like to try an OTC medication to augment his sleep cycle. Which of the following agents may be QB's best option? Caffeine, Zolpidem, Melatonin, or Diphenhydramine. So after today's talk, the goal is to be able to answer each of these three cases and address them appropriately to not only identify the sleep disorder, but to be able to treat the sleep disorder effectively. To start out with a little bit of background about sleep disorders, sleep disorders affect 70 million Americans. And whenever you think about that, that's approximately about 25% of all Americans, if you think about the US population being around 300 million. 60% of these have a chronic sleep disorder. So remember, chronic is a long-standing sleep disorder. And in terms of chronic, we'll consider that greater than three months. We'll talk about duration of sleep disorders in this presentation as well. According to a study by the National Institute of Aging, 80% of patients greater than age 65 reported a sleep-related disturbance. Now, whether that be insomnia, narcolepsy, or some other type of sleep disorder, it's imperative to be aware that sleep disorders do affect lots of patients. And it could be potentially due to the pathophysiology of sleep versus some other genetic factor versus something else that's going on in the patient's environment. To start with the sleep cycle specifically, sleep is divided into non-realm and REM sleep, or non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement sleep. For non-REM or in-REM sleep, it is divided into four stages. The first two stages are essentially stages one and two, and those are stages between wakefulness and sleep. So these are stages where a person may be almost falling asleep initially whenever they start, um, or whenever they go to lie in bed. Stages three and four are at the beginning of a much deeper sleep, also known as delta sleep. And during this time, metabolic and brain waves slow. All of your mental processes start slowing down so that you can go into a much deeper level of sleep. 
and eventually into REM sleep. So rapid eye movement sleep, or REM, is when your brain is electrically and metabolically activated. REM sleep does occur in bursts, and during REM sleep there are a lot of different pathophysiological things happening in the body, such as increased cerebral blood flow, loss of muscle tone, dreaming, as well as cardiac and respiratory rate fluctuations. So respiratory rate may increase, decrease, depending on various sensations that are going on in the body. And as you sleep longer, the cycles of REM sleep lengthen in later stages of sleep. To kind of break that down a little bit more specifically, as this illustration shows, stage one and stage two are lighter levels of sleep. And then whenever stage three begins, that's when our deep sleep begins. We eventually progress to stage four, have a little bit more deeper sleep, rhythmic breathing, and more delta waves. And then once we get through that stage, then we get to that REM sleep stage where you are actually having lots of hyperactivity in terms of brain waves and dreaming um, and more relaxation with the muscles. Another concept that's important to sleep is circadian rhythm. To give you a little bit of background on circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm develops as a person ages. So if you think about infants, whenever a baby is born, babies sleep a significant amount of the day. Infants may sleep up to 20 hours per day. But whenever an infant eventually ages to about the time of three to six months, their actual stages of sleep, such as REM and NREM, are actually established. Around the age of three, this sleep rhythm develops into a circadian rhythm where you actually have certain parts of the day where you're asleep consistently and certain parts of the day where you are awake. And part of this can be attributed to the suprachiasmic nucleus in the brain, which is our biological clock, which kind of tells us essentially when to fall asleep and when to stay awake. However, throughout life, you may have a decline in sleep time and efficiency around the midlife. So whenever you start getting into your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, that's whenever a decline in sleep may actually happen. And whenever you get to be elderly, you may have intermittent or fragmented sleep as a result of this decline and a reduction in slow wave sleep. So essentially, the peak of your circadian rhythm is probably around your adolescent years and probably in your 20s to maybe early 30s. And then once those times are done, then things start to decline again, kind of similar in a way to how infants sleep 20 hours a day. They don't really have that circadian rhythm yet. And it's kind of the same a little bit with the elderly in that they may not sleep as much. In terms of neurochemistry, there are different neurotransmitters and chemicals that regulate sleep. Sleep isn't necessarily localized in one area of the brain either. It's regulated by many different areas of the brain. In terms of the non-REM sleep or the in-REM sleep, those stages are regulated by GABA and adenosine. For REM sleep, REM sleep is more associated with acetylcholine and norepinephrine. In terms of alertness, dopamine specifically. And for wakefulness, norepinephrine and acetylcholine in the cortex, and histamine and neuropeptides such as substance P, corticotropin releasing factor in the hypothalamus. So there's a lot of different factors that are playing a role in terms of neurotransmitters. Some of these may be off at one time, some of them actually may be all occurring at the same time. It's very, very complicated processes that are going on in terms of the neurochemistry of sleep. And to give you a little bit of background, some of these pathways may be important to know in terms of our different pharmacotherapy options, particularly the benzodiazepines, which we've covered 
in epilepsy and status epilepticus, particularly with GABA. Now, you may be asking, how do I diagnose a particular sleep disorder? One way to do so is what's called polysomnography. Essentially, what this means is a sleep study. And similar to epilepsy or status epilepticus, this is done user, using an EEG or electroencephalogram. What's done is that a patient may be brought in for this sleep study. It can be inpatient or outpatient, and most of the time it will be outpatient because insurance will actually cover an outpatient procedure like this. They won't necessarily cover it if it's inpatient due to the cost of staying in a hospital. And during this study, different variables are, are obtained. So sleep onset, arousal, sleep stages, different types of arrhythmias, eye, leg, jaw movements, um, airflow during sleep, respiratory effort, and oxygen desaturations are all measured. And all of this information, along with the EEG, is used to determine what type of sleep disorder a patient may have. Now, in terms of interpreting all this data, I'm not necessarily going to expect you to know how to diagnose a sleep disorder from polysomnography, but it is important just to understand the process through which a patient may have their sleep disorder diagnosed. Another thing with polysomnography is that it does have a high cost associated with it, and depending on a patient's insurance company, it may or may not be approved. To give you a little bit more detailed idea of how this actually looks, so similar to our EEG monitoring from Status Epilepticus, there are different sensors that are placed all on different parts of the body. And as you see here, this patient also has a pulse oximeter one at their finger to measure things such as oxygen in the blood. You also have this polysomnogram record which shows different breathing events over time as well as the different stages of sleep such as REM sleep. The patient is typically strapped in and it actually helps to measure the inspir inspiratory effort whenever they breathe. The sensors measure different things such as eye movements, um, air flow through the nose, and all of these wires eventually go to some computer where ideally a sleep technician is monitoring the patient and is able to look at all of this data in real time. In terms of different sleep disorders, sleep disorders per DSM-5 are known as sleep-wake disorders. And there are many different sleep disorders that exist. In terms of our talk, we're going to talk about selected sleep disorders that you'll commonly see either outpatient or inpatient. The most common of which is insomnia disorder. For insomnia disorder, DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, published by the American Psychiatric Association in 2013, defines insomnia disorder as a dissatisfaction with sleep quantity or quality with one or more of the following characteristics. This may be a difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep, any early morning awakenings or being unable to return to sleep, a sleep disturbance that causes stress that occurs at least three nights per week and is present for greater than or equal to three months, occurs despite adequate opportunity for sleep, not explained by other sleep disorders or not attributable to substance effects such as medications or illicit drugs, or a coexisting mental disorder and medical conditions do not explain the insomnia cause. Now keep this in the back of your mind that this is DSM-5 specifically. Though the DSM-5 definition is not always the definition that's used to define insomnia. There are many different insomnia causes. And despite the fact that DSM-5 says that insomnia is 
defined as when a medical condition or some other factor does not exist. A lot of times in insomnia, there will be some kind of precipitating factor that you'll have to recognize that will actually define the diagnosis of insomnia. And they're actually divided into many different causes. Situational, medical, psychiatric, pharmacologically induced, and hospitalization related. In terms of situational, these can be things such as work or financial stresses, major life events, or interpersonal conflicts. So if you have some kind of stress, such as maybe, you know, you may be going bankrupt, for example, you may be, you might be losing your job or not doing so well at your job. Those things can affect you situationally and cause you to have insomnia. Also jet lag or shift work disorder, which we'll talk about in this talk, will actually be related to insomnia as well. They can be potentially interrelated. For medical, different disease states such as cardiovascular disease states and respiratory disease states can cause insomnia and cause patients to stay awake. Chronic pain can cause insomnia. So think about if a patient's in pain, they might not be able to sleep as well. Different endocrine disorders such as diabetes or hyperthyroidism may cause insomnia. GI disorders. Neurological disorders specifically may cause insomnia. We'll talk a little bit about delirium in a few weeks and how it can drastically affect a patient's perception. We've already talked about epilepsy and Dr. Munji will talk with you about Parkinson's disease. Pregnancy can also affect different um, pregnancy can also affect insomnia as well. There are different psychiatric causes of insomnia. So as you've talked with Dr. Wang about different mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders. Also, drugs are another major cause of insomnia and it's important to be aware of different drugs that can cause insomnia. And some of these are the anti convulsants that we've talked about with epilepsy, central adrenergic blockers, diuretics can cause insomnia, particularly when taken in the late afternoon or nighttime as patients may have to go to the restroom. SSRIs may cause insomnia, steroids, and potentially even stimulants, particularly those stimulants that are related to ADHD. There may also be different hospital related causes of insomnia. Now, whenever you're in the hospital, you may have to be awakened for different labs and procedures, um, as well as whenever a doctor's team comes and rounds on a patient, patient might be waked up to ask how they're feeling, and it may not necessarily be the most appropriate thing for the patient. And coming from my experience, an ICU stay alone can cause insomnia as there are many different alarms that are going off. There are many different tests that are being done. There's more risk of patients developing ICU delirium and all of these things may contribute to insomnia. So as you see here, insomnia has many different causes and it's important to identify potential causes of insomnia and try to treat them first before potentially going to pharmacotherapy. For an insomnia treatment approach, it's based on the different type of disturbance. And insomnia can be transient or a one-time incident, short-term, which means less than three months have occurred since the beginning of the insomnia disorder or chronic, meaning that it's greater than three months. Insomnia is also based on the cause. So if you have a cause that can be easily corrected without pharmacotherapy, then that would be the best method to try to treat that insomnia disorder. Stress management is also another big thing with insomnia. 
if you can manage your stress and the stress is something that is keeping the patient from going to sleep properly, proper stress management can help mitigate insomnia. Sleep hygiene and stimulus control are also important non-pharmacological methods of managing insomnia. Also, patient education about medications and dependency can be important in the treatment of insomnia. OTC and prescription medications may be important factors to consider when treating insomnia, whether an OTC or prescription medication is causing insomnia or if an OTC or prescription medication is needed to treat insomnia. But above all, especially if a medication is causing insomnia, unnecessary, unnecessary pharmacotherapy should be eliminated when possible. To start talking about non-pharmacological methods to manage insomnia, we'll start with sleep hygiene. In sleep hygiene, there are things that you should do to minimize or to mitigate your actual sleep. So these are practices that will actually benefit your sleep cycle and cause patients potentially to get the most out of their sleep. Things such as exercising regularly but not close to bedtime may help patients sleep better. Avoiding temperature extremes, loud noises, and even illuminated clocks will be important to maximize sleep potential as ex temperature extremes and loud noises can keep patients awake for longer. And illuminated clocks, if present, or any type of other light source so, such as electronics, particularly iPads, computers, cell phones, especially if they're making noises or if they light up, may cause patients to stay awake. Reduction in alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine usages. Caffeine and nicotine are stimulants. Alcohol is a depressant and may actually keep some people up. Though alcohol does have depressing effects as well and may actually cause patients to go to sleep depends on the patient how alcohol will actually affect them, though it's not recommended for patients to drink excessive amounts of alcohol just for overall health purposes. It's important not to drink large amounts of liquids in the evening. This kind of goes without saying that the patient may have to go to the restroom in the middle of the night, and that can cause midnight awakenings. It's important to establish the bed to be a place for intimacy and sleep only. When you start doing other activities in bed, such as reading, going, and doing other activities, such as potentially surfing the web on your computer or iPad, and other things like that, establish the bed as a place where other activities can be done. And what our brains essentially need to be for themselves is to be trained to recognize a bed as a place to go to sleep, which essentially will train the brain to fall asleep easier when going to bed. Versus if you were to establish the bed as a place where other activities are done, which may make it harder to sleep. Also, for patients who have problems sleeping, a sleep diary may be an important thing to start. A sleep diary essentially documents different things such as time when patients go to sleep, time whenever they awake, situations where patients may have had trouble sleeping, you know, different precipitating factors that make it difficult for a patient to sleep. All of these can be recorded in a sleep diary. Other pharmacological methods include, um, in addition to sleep hygiene, include stimulus control. Essentially what stimulus control is, is trying to establish good sleep habits in addition to sleep hygiene. So establishing regular times to wake up and go to sleep is important. Sleeping only as much as necessary to feel rested. Now, depending on the person, one person may only need four hours of sleep to sufficiently function during the day. One person may need seven to eight hours of sleep to function properly. Some people may need longer, such as 10 hours. It just depends on the person. 
you should only go to bed whenever you're sleepy and don't force sleep. So if you're not falling asleep after about 15 to 20 minutes, it may be beneficial to go and get up and do some other type of activity until you're actually ready to fall asleep. It's also important in most cases to avoid daytime naps as these can throw off your circadian rhythm a bit. One example where there is an exception to this rule is narcolepsy and we'll talk a little bit about that whenever we talk about narcolepsy in this talk. There are different pharmacotherapy options for insomnia. The antihistamines, the antidepressants, the benzodiazepines, the benzodiazepine receptor agonists or the BZDRAs, the orexin receptor antagonist, the melatonin receptor agonist, as well as different herbal options that are available to help treat insomnia. And it's important to be aware of each of these different classes as well as what agents are in these classes, different considerations for using these drugs such as populations that may not benefit from these drugs as a result of a contraindication or potential side effects or even restrictions related to drugs, particularly with those drugs that are scheduled. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these classes in general. The first class we'll discuss are the antihistamines. So diphenhydramine, doxolamine, chlorpheniramine, and diaminhydronate are your antihistamines. And all these antihistamines exhibit sedating properties. All these, or at least most of these, are available OTC, so over the counter. And whenever you start taking an antihistamine, tolerance can build up pretty quickly. So for example, if a patient was to start taking Benadryl, they started out at a normal dose of you know 12 and a half milligrams to 25 milligrams every night. And they did that for about a month. They might not get the same response at the end of that month as they did at the beginning of that month. Some important anticholinergic side effects to be aware of are dry mouth, constipation, and urinary retention, and there are many others that aren't listed here. As a result of these anticholinergic side effects as well as potential carryover sedation, these agents should be avoided in the elderly if possible. And they are agents that are considered to be on the Beers criteria, which Dr. Munji will talk about. These are agents that should be monitored or restricted in the elderly population. Antidepressants are another class of drugs that potentially treat insomnia. And these include your tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline, mirtazapine, and trazodone. However, SSRIs will not treat insomnia because remember SSRIs are non-sedating. Antidepressants may be considered as an alternative for those who have a history of depression, pain, or a risk of substance abuse because the antidepressants are not controlled substances. At least these antidepressants are not. The antidepressants will induce sleep onset and continuity. And the doses for insomnia treatment are not effective for depression. So the doses actually may be lower for the antidepressant agents in terms of insomnia treatment. So that's important to be aware about. Just to give you a little bit of background of some things you may want to know about these antidepressants, amitriptyline and nortriptyline have anticholinergic side effects, we, which we discussed with the antihistamine agents. They have adrenergic blockade and potential for QT prolongation. Doxepin, the low dose, is FDA approved for sleep maintenance insomnia. For mirtazapine or Remeron, it may cause daytime sedation and weight gain, which this may be a good agent potentially for patients who have had a recent weight loss or need to potentially gain weight. 
Trazodone is another antidepressant that's popular for use in substance abuse patients, particularly the VA population where it's used a lot. And trazodone may also be beneficial for patients who have SSRI or bupropion-induced insomnia. One thing to watch out for with trazodone is orthostasis, which essentially means that patients may have alterations in blood pressure um, when they take this medication. So it's important to counsel these patients whenever they're getting up or um, down to hold on to something sturdy so that they do not hurt themselves. The next class of agents we'll talk about is the benzodiazepines. And the benzodiazepines that are used for sleep are primarily thorazepam, quazepam, temazepam, and triazolam. The agent that's probably used the most out of all these agents is temazepam. And benzodiazepines improve sleep onset and increase total sleep time. These increase stage two sleep and decrease delta sleep. However, these agents are not for pregnant patients as they are considered pregnancy category X. They're also not recommended for patients who have a history of substance abuse as many of the benzodiazepine agents are a control for class. It's important as with many of the different drug classes to use the lowest dose possible to minimize rebound insomnia and potential side effects. Similar to the antihistamines, tolerance may develop particularly after one month of use, so you may not get the same benefit from the same dose one month later after you've started taking a benzodiazepine. Side effects commonly seen with benzodiazepines, which you are probably aware about by now, are daytime sedation, potential psychomotor incarnation, tolerance as we just discussed, as well as enterograde amnesia. So patients who take benzodiazepines may not remember certain events later on. In terms of the different benzodiazepine agents, it's important to recognize the doses of these agents, the Tmax of these agents, and the half-life of these agents. The reason why it's important to know the Tmax and the half-life particularly is depending on which agent you have. Some agents may be better for sleep onset, and some may be better for sleep maintenance, or some agents could be potentially used for both. For example, temazepam has a Tmax of one and a half hours, and a decently long half-life of 10 to 15 hours which will make it good at sleep onset and sleep maintenance. However, triazolam, which has a shorter Tmax or a slightly shorter Tmax of one hour, may be beneficial for sleep onset. However, because its half-life is two hours, may not be good for sleep maintenance compared to the other agents in the class, such as temazepam and quazepam, which has a half-life of 39 hours. So it's important to know at least how these different half-lives stack up. It may not necessarily be the most important thing to know the specific numbers, but at least how they rank in terms of their half-life and their team max. It's also important to recognize the doses of these agents. You may be able to get away with seven and a half milligrams for quazepam and temazepam to start out with, but those can be titrated up. The next class of drugs we'll talk about is the benzodiazepine receptor agonists, or the BCDRAs. And these drugs are probably one of the most popular classes used for insomnia. They're also known as the Z drugs, so zolpidem, zolepilon, or s zolpiclone All of them have a Z in them. These are non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, and they bind to GABA-A to induce sleep. So think about GABA. GABA is one of our big inhibitory neurotransmitters, and that's how it induces sleep. These will reduce sleep latency, and latency is another term for onset, as well as nocturnal awakenings, and these can also increase total sleep time, potentially, depending on which one you have. It's important as a warning to start with the lowest dose possible. And again, similar to the antihistamines, as well as 
the benzodiazepine agents. Avoid these on the elderly if possible. They're not the best agents to use on the elderly population, as these agents are also on the Beer's criteria list for cautionary use or restricted use. The reason why it's important to start with the lowest dose possible for these agents is that the FDA actually had released a few warnings regarding the use of the BZDRAs. Um, not just in the elderly population, but in the general population of any age. So the first one you'll see here is FDA approves new label changes and dosing for Zolpidem products and a recommendation to avoid driving the day after using Ambien CR. This is as a result of patients who were taking Zolpidem and having excessive daytime sleepiness, so much so that it caused them to be drowsy the next day. And it can potentially cause problems, if, especially if you're driving or operating some type of heavy machinery. That can be very dangerous. And a similar warning was also an issue with Escesopoclone or Lunesta. So given these FDA warnings, it's imperative that you start with the lowest dose possible of these agents and it will be important for you to know the different dosing of these agents as they are some of the most popular agents currently used for insomnia. To break it down a little bit, Zolpidem comes in different formulations. It comes as Ambien, Ambien CR, and Intermezzo. Um, Ambien is the standard Zolpidem. Ambient CR is the control release which can be used for sleep onset as well as potentially sleep maintenance. Intermezzo is actually a formulation of Zolpidem that was released within the last few years and what this Intermezzo does is it's actually used for the middle of the night awakenings. So say if a patient wakes up in the middle of the night they can actually take a reduced dose of Zolpidem particularly the 1.75 here, and that will cause them to go back to sleep. In terms of Zolpidem specifically, it has a relatively short Tmax of 1.6 hours, so it is good for sleep onset, and a half-life of 2 to 2.6 hours. Some adverse effects you may see with it are obviously drowsiness, amnesia, dizziness, headache, GI complaints. Other things that you may see, particularly with Zolpidem, as well as potentially with the other Z drugs, are sleepwalking and sleep eating. This can be very dangerous for any population, whether it be young or old. Zaleplon or Sonata is another agent that's commonly used. Typical doses between 5 and 10 milligrams. If you're starting out low and going slow, you should start with 5 and it's recommended that 5 milligrams is stored in the elderly. Zolepolon has a Tmax of 1 hour and a half-life of 1 hour. So this would make it good for sleep onset, but not sleep maintenance. Now, there have been some physicians as well as practitioners who have practiced with Zolepolon, potentially double dosing Zolepolon particularly if the patient isn't sleeping well enough to where they have a nighttime awakening. They may actually dose the Leplon, similar to Intermezzo or the reduced strength Zolpidem, to try to get the patient to sleep throughout the night. So this agent could be potentially double dosed, though it's not necessarily indicated for double dosing. That's just an FYI. You may see dizziness, headache, or somnolence with this medication. Escesopoclone or Lunesta is the other Z drug. Its daily doses are between 1 mg and 3 mg. Tmax is similar to Zolpidem and Zoleplon. However, this agent actually has a long half life. Therefore, this agent would be the best agent for both sleep maintenance as well as sleep onset. Patients may have an unpleasant taste, a headache, or somnolence or dry mouth after taking Lunesta. Sevarexin or Balsamra is actually one of the newest agents released for insomnia. Its mechanism of action is an orexin A and B receptor antagonist. And we'll talk a little bit more about orexin 
whenever we talk about narcolepsy. Essentially what this mechanism does is it helps turn off the wake signaling um, instead of inducing sleepiness. So it's essentially turning off your active wake cycle instead of depressing your body to induce sleep. One thing to make note of is that this agent is a controlled substance, it is a C4 substance. And it's recommended doses between 10 and 20 milligrams at bedtime for sleep induction and maintenance. So it does do both sleep induction and maintenance. Some adverse effects of this medication include somnolence, obviously, as well as narcolepsy-like symptoms. And this agent is actually contraindicated for narcolepsy. And we'll kind of discuss the reason why whenever we start talking about narcolepsy shortly. Romeltion is a melatonin receptor agonist, which is FDA approved for sleep onset insomnia. And because it acts similar to melatonin, it regulates circadian rhythm and sleep onset. However, it does not provide benefits for sleep maintenance. It's not a controlled substance like a lot of the other hypnotics that we've talked about. And the recommended dose is eight milligrams in bedtime for sleep induction. Its adverse effects include headache, dizziness, and somnolence. Herbal medications also may be considered for insomnia. Melatonin is probably the most popular of the herbal medications. Melatonin is obviously a melatonin receptor agonist. And for insomnia specifically, recommended dose is between three and five milligrams nightly. Like its cousin, Romeltion, which is the, a synthetic analog, melatonin is a, an herbal analog and does the same essential process as Romeltion. It regulates circadian rhythm and sleep onset. However, it doesn't work for sleep maintenance. Another herbal option that may be used for sleep ins and insomnia is valerian. Its mechanism isn't fully understood, but some have theorized that it may be a beneficial agent due to its increased GABA activity, but it's not understood fully. The recommended dose is 300 to 600 milligrams nightly. And dried herbal valerian can be soaked in one cup of hot water for 20 to 25 minutes to help treat symptoms of insomnia. This is a simple insomnia algorithm that shows you what to do in terms of short-term and chronic insomnia. Now remember for transient insomnia, transient insomnia is commonly a one-time instance and should be treated ideally with non-pharmacological therapy or minimizing or eliminating the cause of that transient incident. Now for short-term insomnia, it's important to always apply sleep hygiene and you can use short-acting BZDRA or Romeltion. If you have an adequate therapeutic response, you're good, but if you don't, you can try other agents. Now, this is not necessarily a hard and fast algorithm, as you have to take into account each of the different factors that a patient may have. A lot of times with sleep disorders, you have to adequately assess the patient and reasons why you would not give a patient a certain medication. And that's probably more important than this algorithm here. Now, if you have patients that have chronic insomnia, it'll be also important to in institute sleep hygiene and treat the underlying cause. The next sleep-wake disorder that we'll discuss are breathing-related sleep disorders, so the different apnea, apnea disorders. To define what sleep apnea is, it's repetitive breathing cessation during sleep followed by a brief awakening to restart breathing. So these patients have issues trying to breathe during sleep. There are two different types of sleep apneas. There's what's called obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea, which is characterized by upper airway collapse and obstruction. 
and central sleep apnea, which is an impairment of the respiratory drive, not related to some type of obstruction. Sleep apnea can be diagnosed via PSG or by DSM-5 criteria. To go a little bit more in depth into what obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea is, its epidemiology is classified mostly by older individuals with greater than 20% characterizing this. Again, it's characterized by upper airway collapse and obstruction. So there's something wrong anatomically that is causing these patients to have breathing issues while asleep. In terms of its diagnosis, it may be classified by nocturnal breathing disturbances. So these patients may be snoring, snorting, gasping, making weird noises or breathing pauses during sleep, which may be explained by obstructive sleep apnea. Now, just because you have snoring doesn't necessarily mean that you have obstructive sleep apnea. You have to go through a whole diagnostic phase, such as with PSG or with DSM-5, to actually diagnose this. Other things that you may consider are daytime sleepiness. These patients will have lots of daytime sleepiness, fatigue, and unrefreshing sleep despite sufficient opportunities to sleep. So their sleep is not fully maximized, despite that they may be getting, you know, the normal eight hours of sleep that many patients need to f sufficiently function. They are not getting good sleep. For obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea, treatment approaches to start non-pharmacologically. So one thing that these patients can do is potentially to reduce their weight. One thing that a lot of these patients have is either an elevated weight or potentially obesity. And what that elevated weight or obesity is doing to these patients is a lot of that weight is pressing down anatomically on the neck as well as the chest particularly in those areas where you need to breathe. And whenever you have more pressure exerted on your different breathing areas of the body, it makes it harder to breathe. Therefore, patients who are overweight or obese may benefit from weight reduction. Positional therapy is another non-pharmacological method to treat obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea. What this is, is positioning the body in such a way that it will make the patient breathe easier. Now this can be on the patient's back, on their patient's stomach, on their side, whatever helps to help that patient breathe. Avoiding CNS depressants is important to the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. So if these are, patients are on CNS depressants such as benzos, other sedatives, etc they may develop a decreased respiratory drive and make it harder for patients to breathe at night. And one of the gold standards for non-pharmacological therapy for obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea is positive airway pressure. And this can be done by a nasal PAP or nasal positive airway pressure or via CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. Essentially, what it looks like is seen here on your right. This is a nasal PAP device. The device covers the nose and provides air for the patient to breathe. Now, the benefit of this device is it does help the patient breathe easier. The con of the device is obviously that the patient is strapped in to this device, and this device is applying a lot of pressure through the tube, through the patient's nose. And some patients may actually not mesh with the device very well. Some patients may get very agitated while on this device. So it will be definitely something for the patients to try out to see if they're able to do that. And if they're not, they may do any of the other non-pharmacological therapies before transitioning to a pharmacological therapy. 
Modafinil and armadafinil are two pharmacological therapies that may be used for obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea. Essentially what these agents are doing is they're helping to treat the excessive daytime sleepiness side effects of obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea. Now if a patient doesn't have excessive daytime sleepiness, these agents may not benefit the patient. Another route that patients can go is surgery. So patients may have procedures done which may enable them to breathe a little bit easier. One type of surgery is called a uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty. Essentially what's done here is that the areas of the neck as well as the different breathing apparatuses such as the trachea, the larynx, etc. may be manipulated so that the patient can breathe a little bit easier. A tracheostomy can also be done and what a tracheostomy is is essentially an incision within the neck which is then linked or is potentially linked to a ventilator device such as that provided by CPAP or the patients may be able to breathe through a little that little incision in their neck without any additional mechanical ventilatory support. It's important to realize with the tracheostomy is that it is invasive, but if the patient doesn't need the tracheostomy anymore, the tracheostomy can actually be removed and the incision actually heals within a few weeks to about a month or so. So it's not necessarily a permanent thing, though for these patients, if you're getting to the surgery route, which is considered typically last line, it may be pretty severe and the patients may need this lifelong. So as we talked about with obstructive sleep apnea hypotonia, there's no drug therapy designated first line. The first line is not pharmacological and it should only be tried after positive airway pressure therapy is optimized. Wake promoting medications such as modafinil or armadafinil may be used, but it's important to realize that these should not be used in cardiovascular disease. Now, in terms of modafinil and armadafinil, both they're also controlled substances. These medications are C4 substances. These medications should not be used in patients who have a history of substance abuse. To give you a little simple algorithm over obstructive sleep apnea, you may see here. And similar to what we discussed, nasal CPAP therapy is first line as well as non-pharmacological weight loss. If the patient is having excessive daytime sleepiness, they may use modafinil or armadafinil. And if that's not able to work, then they may consider alternative therapies such as surgery or other oral devices. To transition a little bit, now we'll talk about um, central sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea is fragmented and consequence daytime somnolence with arousals from sleep not required to initiate airflow. Essentially what's happening here is some other kind of central process that is not related to obstruction. It's an absence of airflow from the nose or mouth without inspiratory muscle activation. And it's diagnosed in a similar way to obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea. Some of the different causes that may be related to sleep, central sleep apnea include neurological, so autonomic lesions, encephalitis, myasthenia gravis, etc. These may depress the respiratory drive just as a result of the neurological disease. High altitudes may also generate a central sleep apnea, particularly if you're taking a trip to a high altitude and you live mostly at low altitudes. Other things that may be associated with central sleep apnea and may cause central sleep apnea are opioid abuse. So think about opioids as a class. One of their common side effects is respiratory depression. If you take enough opioids at the point of abuse, this may actually depress respiratory drive and generate a central sleep apnea. CHF is also another potential cause of sleep apnea. Now, in terms of 
treatment for central sleep apnea, you should always try to correct the underlying cause if possible. However, the treatment pharmacologically is limited to acetazolamide or fiofolin. For acetazolamide specifically, what acetazolamide does is it will dump bicarb renally, and this will actually cause a um, a metabolic acidosis. Now, whenever you have a metabolic acidosis, as you remember from your acid-base disorders, it will actually compensate by generating a respiratory alkalosis or a little bit of um, hyperventilation. So remember, if you dump um, bicarb, you generate an acidosis, and then as a result of generating an acidosis, you have to equilibrate by generating an alkalosis. So now that we've talked about sleep apnea, the next type of sleep wake disorders we'll talk about, or the next sleep disorder we'll talk about is narcolepsy. What narcolepsy is, is it's characterized by recurrent periods of need to sleep, lapsing into sleep, or napping occurring within the same day. It commonly begins when patients are in their 20s and may get worse by the time they get into their 30s and 40s. Commonly, narcolepsy occurs at least three times per week over the last three months to be diagnosed. And the problem with narcolepsy is that there is some deficiency in the neurotransmitter system known as the hypocretin or rexin system. Essentially, what's going on in this system is a deficiency of hypocretin or rexin, which are generating these narcolepsy-like symptoms. And the narcolepsy-like symptoms are four different symptoms that you may see. So excessive daytime sleepiness, which is similar to your different sleep apneas. A cataplexy, which is essentially a loss of muscle tone, particularly in your lower limbs, which actually may cause patients to fall down and collapse. Hallucinations, as well as sleep paralysis. So these patients, once they fall asleep, they're pretty much paralyzed where they're at until they wake up. So, to show you what this actually looks like pathophysiologically, you have different orexin neurons in your brain. And these neurons eventually stimulate your dorsal raphe and your locus ceruleus. However, in narcolepsy, because you're not having any hypocretin or orexin, or not as much hypocretin or orexin, the dorsal raphe without that will generate these cataplexy like episodes as you can see with this guy here who is about to fall down or even a pathological fragmentation of wakefulness so essentially these patients are essentially going to sleep at random times during the day as you can see here with the guy talking to this girl having a cup of coffee in order to treat narcolepsy there are some pharmacological and non-pharmacological things that you can do so the best thing to do is good sleep hygiene to start out with. Now, in terms of sleep hygiene, daytime naps may actually be used for benefit in narcolepsy, and daytime naps may be done to try to equilibrate or try to prevent other episodes of falling asleep. So daytime naps of 15 minutes or so may actually prevent a, a later sudden sleep onset that may develop as a result of narcolepsy. Some pharmacological things that you can do for narcolepsy affect particularly excessive daytime somnolence or EDS as well as cataplexy. So agents that will stimulate a patient's brain, such as amphetamines, modafinil, or modafinil, and selegiline may be beneficial for excessive daytime somnolence. Also, another agent called sodium oxabate can potentially help with excessive daytime somnolence. Now, this sodium oxabate is a controlled substance, and it's typically a CNS depressant. However, it may actually help with excessive daytime somnolence. 
as well as cataplexy as well. It's the only drug that can actually treat both of these symptoms. In terms of cataplexy specifically, remember cataplexy is the loss of muscle tone in the lower limbs. It may be treated with tricyclic antidepressants such as nortriptyline, imipramine, or protriptyline, fluoxetine, venlafaxine, as well as sodium oxybate, which we mentioned before. In terms of treating narcolepsy, depending on what symptoms you have, dictates what you do pharmacologically. So if you have excessive daytime sleepiness, you may use a stimulant or sodium oxalate or selegiline or any of the other stimulants. Now if you have cataplexy, you may use any of the other agents that we just talked about, such as the TCAs, venlafaxine, fluoxetine, or sodium oxalate. So it's really a patient driven treatment. So depending on what the patient has is what you treat. The last type of sleep weight disorders that we'll discuss are circadian rhythm sleep weight disorders. The first one we'll discuss is jet lag. So jet lag is a pretty common sleep weight disturbance which is defined as external environment being mismatched with an individual's biological clock. This commonly results from patients who travel across different time zones. So the extent of the jet lag can last anywhere from 2 to 10 days depending on the extent traveled. So say if we're in Fresno and we travel to New Mexico which is predominantly in the mountain standard time it may not be as bad as if we went from Fresno to London which is probably around um, 10 to 14 time zones away. Some symptoms of jet lag include a dysphoric mood, diminished physical performance as a result of not being used to the time that they're in, cognitive impairments, as well as gastrointestinal disturbances. Some different treatments that you can use for jet lag include sleep adjustments. So this can include adjusting your sleep such that you either stay awake one to two hours later or you go to sleep one to two hours earlier depending on which direction you're traveling in either east or west. Optimizing light exposure may be beneficial for jet lag as light exposure helps to kind of dictate a little bit of your circadian rhythm and your biological clock so your body is recognizing light exposure as your daytime hours versus dark exposure which will represent your nighttime hours. It's important to refrain from alcohol usage just like any other sleep wake disorder or any other disease state. Some pharmacological therapies you may use for jet lag include melatonin. As we talked about melatonin can augment your sleep cycle and it actually may be the treatment of choice for jet lag. Now depending on what kind of symptoms you're having with jet lag, say if you're not able to get to sleep or if you want to get to sleep earlier, a short-acting BZDRA may also help, so zopidem, esopicum, zoeplon may help. Or melteon, similar to melatonin, may also help with jet lag. Patients may also consider caffeine before noon time. Now the caffeine is obviously a stimulant and having caffeine before noon may benefit patients who are potentially having a rough time um, around midday of staying awake. So caffeine may actually help the patient stay awake enough to try to regulate their sleep cycle as a result of jet lag. Armadophanil has a questionable role in jet lag. There is some data potentially supporting its use in jet lag and some data not supporting its use. It's kind of unknown at this point whether or not it will actually work. But it is a potential option patients can use. There is this great New England Journal of Medicine article on jet lag, which I recommend that you read. It's optional reading, but it kind of explains the process of jet lag and different strategies that you can use that we've talked about here. 
The last type of sleep-wake disorder, we'll talk about a shift-work disorder. This is another common sleep disorder, which is characterized by a misalignment of the sleep-wake cycle and circadian rhythm due to working unconventional hours. So, common example of this would be a patient who is working the night shift, essentially, at any job that they may, they may have. What's interesting about shift work disorder or patients who work at later hours of the night, these patients have actually been found statistically to have higher risk of injury, divorce, substance abuse, peptic ulcers, depression, cancer, and accidents. Not sure if it's necessarily due to their altered sleep cycle or not, but it's just something to be aware about. Treatment approaches, approaches for sleep, sh I'm sorry, shift work disorder include schedule and exposure to bright lights at night and the darkness during the daytime. So kind of a similar concept to jet lag where we're trying to expose patients to light whenever we're trying to equilibrate them to some kind of normal daytime schedule. Um, two to three hour naps on the days off from work may actually help them um, equilibrate to their new designated daytime hours and nighttime hours depending on if they're trying to keep that current schedule or if they're trying to actually shift around their sleep schedule. And it just depends on the individual case and the patient presentation. Sleeping in the afternoons may help as well. So again, this is another exception where um, napping may be acceptable. And different pharmacological therapy depending on what you essentially need. So if you need to be stimulated to stay awake longer, modafinil or armodafinil may help with that. Now if you need to go to sleep earlier, if you're trying to adjust your sleep schedule, short-acting PCDRAs or melting or melatonin can help you. Again, it just depends on the patient situation. This is the jet lag and shift work disorder algorithm that is in your DePiro 10th edition. So as we said, jet lag, short acting BZDRA, Romeltion or melatonin for shift work disorder, um, bright light exposure at night, darkness during the day, and then potentially stimulants for daytime sleepiness and sedation for um, daytime sleep or different treatment modalities you can use. Here is the overall algorithm for all of the sleep disorders that we've discussed today. For a bigger copy of this algorithm, it's you may pull your 10th edition DePiro Pharmacotherapy book. Now remember, for the purposes of examination and practice, that you may not go distinctively off of each of these treatments because remember that you're treating the patient and whatever the patient's presentation is as well as their symptoms. So keep that in the back of your mind because there are many different other agents for insomnia or short-term insomnia for example that you may actually have listed here depending on what patient characteristics you see in front of you. Here are the references for this talk today, and we'll go over the cases. So we had SW, the struggling P3 pharmacy student who wasn't doing so hot. He had nightmares, filled he was failing like pharmacy school. He also had episodes where he was falling asleep randomly in the student lounge while talking to his friends. Which sleep disorder does SW most likely have? The answer to this question is narcolepsy. Uh, this is characterized primarily because he's fallen asleep randomly in the student lounge. He's had lots of nightmares. Another thing that may be characteristic of narcolepsy, which we didn't necessarily see in this case, is cataplexy. So essentially a loss of the muscle tone. It's not insomnia because he's not necessarily having difficulty falling asleep. He's falling asleep pretty well, actually. Sleep apnea would be more associated with some kind of breathing issue potentially while sleeping. And he hasn't traveled recently from what we see in this case, so jet lag would probably not be the option to pick here. Narcolepsy is the answer. 
our second case, we have DM, our 82-year-old Caucasian female, coming to you for a recommendation to help her sleep. She's had trouble initiating sleep over the last four months and is not taking any other medications. Which of the following would you recommend for her? The answer to this question is Romelteon. The reason why you would recommend Romelteon versus the other three agents is because two of the agents, diphenhydramine and doxylamine, are antihistamines and ideally should be avoided in the elderly if possible as they are various list criteria drugs and cause um, excessive sedation as well as potential falls in this population. Zolpidem is the same concept. It's a BZDRA and also a beer's list drug. Therefore, Romelteon, by exclusion, is the best answer here. QB, our 33-year-old PGY2 critical care pharmacy resident, traveled from Houston to Fresno, and he wanted to avoid jet lag. So which of the following OTC medications would you give him? The answer to this question is melatonin. Now, in terms of picking the correct answer here, he wanted to try an OTC medication, so therefore Zolpidem would not be indicated. Diphenhydramine, we did not list as an agent that you can use for jet lag, so the answer would be between caffeine and melatonin. Now, caffeine may be recommended if he was going to take it before noon, potentially. However, the question does ask which of these augment his sleep cycle, and caffeine would not be an augmenter of the sleep cycle. An augmenter of the sleep cycle would be a melatonin receptor agonist, such as Romelteon or melatonin, which is the correct answer to this question. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Have a great night.